repairs of pockets and getting to where it needs to go. Massive problem. The bureaucracy in our education system and the bureaucracy in our government is stunning. And the government bureaucracy has been controlling the political process, controlling the government process, and running the government for the, the bureaucracy's own benefit. Not for the benefit of the taxpayers and not for the benefit of, the, of the, where the money should go back in the communities to help the, the folks who it's designed for. We are going to deal with this. It ain't going to be pretty. It ain't going to be easy. Because the groups in there who make their money from that bureaucracy, they are strong. Woo, they're strong. And they don't like what I'm saying. It's OK. It's OK. The government union bosses are doing their job. They're doing their job. We've got to respect that. But somebody's got to do a job for taxpayers. Somebody's got to do a job for school children. Somebody's got to do a job for small business owners. Somebody's got to do a job for homeowners. They've all been left out of this process in Illinois for years. Well, I'm representing those folks, and I'm working for you and everybody, every homeowner, every taxpayer, every small business owner. That's who's got to be represented in the government more. That's, why we're, that's what we've got to change. Everybody wants to talk about tax rates. We've got to look at our tax base, and then the big thing is we've got to look at the level of economic activity. We have not been a growth state for a long time. We have to change that. If all we want to argue about is tax rates, we will fail. And every economist, whether they're liberal or conservative, doesn't matter. Every economist will tell you the best way to have a growing economy is to have low rates and a broad base. Low, simple, and broad. We don't do that. We, ta we tax a bunch of stuff, not at all, and we tax a few things really highly, and it's very ineffective, and our, and our uh, economic activity and our business growth is suffering as a result. This has got to be our primary goal. We've got to become pro-business, pro-growth, pro-investment, and we're not today. And we've got to change that big time. Engage, embrace free enterprise, competition, and growth. That's just quick, quick slides. I'll slide through it. I like to compare. So everything I do, I comp I'm going to compare to the five states around us, and I'm going to compare ourselves to other states, Michigan, Ohio, Tennessee, Texas. So there's 13 states. I'll look at all states, but I'm going to look at 13 states in every metric. And we'll have the data. This, uh, let me tell you, the states who touch us are pretty weak s siblings, really. I mean, that's a, that's a low bar. You know, that, that's, you know, Tennessee, Texas, Georgia, Florida, they're kicking tails compared. To, but let's just compare to our neighbors. Look at, I mean, come on. <laughs> come on. We should be thriving compared to Indiana and, and uh, Iowa. And they're kicking our tails. And it frosts me no end every time I hear a story about a company moving over to Indiana or a job moving up to Wisconsin. And I grew up in Lake County, and I hear stories from my neighbors and my friends, Lake County sliding up the job, sliding up the Kenosha, sliding up the Whitewater, sliding away. Come on. There's no good reason for that. It should be coming the other way. And when we fix this, I'll travel the nation on my nickel recruiting companies to come to the state of Illinois, come to Champaign County, come to Lake County, come to Effingham County, come to Winnebago County. They'll be coming. They want to be here, except for our regulations and our taxes. How does Illinois rank? You pick the issue. We, we just pick four random things. We're always in the bottom. Why? I mean, you know, I like to be an inspirational guy. How about if we aspire to be average? <laughs> Let's aspire to be average. We'll be way better off. Look at, I mean, we're, I mean, good grief. Top states, ranking, pick, you can, you can, this is two, two examples. Where's Illinois? 48. Come on. We, we won't fix any problem if we stay like this. There's no way. So let's, a few examples. Our workers' comp. This was the number one complaint. Two, two complaints I hear from businesses. I've, I put 160,000 miles driving the state in the campaign. I've met with thousands of business owners. Two things I heard, I heard a lot. A lot of frustration, and many more companies thinking about leaving than I realized. But the two things I heard a lot about, workers' comp and, and property taxes, probably at the top of the list. But, and these are relatively, you know, so we're horrible. I mean, we're seventh worst. Unemployment insurance costs, brutally high, way higher than the rest of the nation. Um, lawsuit climate, we're 46th. Come on. And we have a system, guys. You know what? We, we're one of the few states where the judges are elected, totally elected. And they get set up who can run by the political machine. 
So you, you, judges get elected, and guess what? The trial lawyers are unlimited in how much campaign cash they can give to the judges when they run. And the trial lawyer who's going to argue the case in front of that judge who gave him 300 grand to run, hello? <laughs> it's a fundamental conflict of interest. We have a broken system in our legal system. And the trial lawyers and the judges are in cahoots and they're driving our malpractice insurance through the roof. Our liability rates through the roof, insurance cross punishing, arbitration brutal on the companies, and, and so healthcare providers and businesses leave. Hello, this is, we can't have this. This is just fundamental conflict inside our government. We have the second highest property taxes in America. We're tied basically, we're basically tied with New Jersey. I don't want to be tied with New Jersey on anything. And, and it's not a coincidence that we have the highest property taxes in America, and we in New Jersey are neck and neck every year for out-migration. That ain't a coincidence. And I travel the state, and I've met with hundreds and hundreds and thousands of families, and I've, many of them said, Bruce, I'm on limited income. I can't afford to stay in my house anymore. I can't afford the real estate taxes. It's ridiculous. There's no, there's no reason for this. Why should we be the worst, on, you know? This is punishing to our families and our homeowners, and it's punishing to a lot of businesses. And, and by the way, I don't, I don't want to pick too much on New Jersey, but let me tell you something. There's a lot of people saying, oh, it's happy feet, New Jersey's getting turned around. Let me tell you something. The, you know, the reason there's happy feet in New Jersey is because they're not paying in their pensions. That ain't a solution, and I'm not going to do that in Illinois. We're gonna, if we got a pension, we're going to pay it, and we're going we're gonna... to... Now, we need to change our pensions because they're unaffordable, and we can talk about that. We, we, the math is stunning. I don't know if it's in these slides. I pick out only a few of the slides for every talk. I've done this a half dozen times, so not every slide's in this deck, but there's a lot to talk about in pensions, and we've got a very detailed plan on how we're going to fix it. But um, here's, here's an issue. Illinois, this is, again, where we're not thoughtful about this. We are very narrow in our sales tax base and high in our sales tax. And, uh, and we're not, and we're, we're, we're out of balance, and we're not competitive. And we've got to, we've got to look at our entire tax code. And, ho and you know what, so with all the anti-business structure, and the regulations and the taxes, guess what? Look at this. Well, these are weak, weak sisters for around us. Look at us for the last, what's, it, what's that, 10, 11 years? Look at the out-migration from Illinois. Hello? How are we going to pay for pensions with that? How are we going to fund schools with that? There's the numbers. Anybody who can choose, people who can choose are leaving Illinois. The, out, the migration among the states, we're losing. And people are leaving to get a job, or they're leaving because they're connected to job creation and they're moving their company and taking their jobs with them. Big problem. Big, big problem. And here's a really critical issue. So here um, in Illinois, we've had declining real average family income. This is a metric for me. It's a fundamental. I want real family income in Illinois rising. It's been falling for a long time. Other states, it's been rising. It's not, it's not rising in Illinois. This is key to the American dream, the better life. We got to have a better, we have to have rising incomes. That comes not by force but by competition and a thriving economy and comp <coughs> companies competing to hire workers and a workforce that's highly educated, well-trained, can drive the maximum productivity to drive their wages up. That's what we got to do, and we're not doing it. Okay, so now let's talk about the government for just a second. So this is, this is, this is the definition of unsustainability. Jobs, basically flat. That's our government. This is state government spending. Yeah, exactly. Hello. Not sustainable. Just not. We can all, you know, and raising income taxes are not <laughs> going to fix this problem. And you know what really frosts me? So we've had our debt going up, and, and, and the politicians have been hiding. When we don't pay a pension, uh, payment according to the actuarial calculations, according to the assets in there, 
that's basically, it has the net effect of borrowing from the pensions at 8.3% because our pensions have been generating 8.3% on average for 32 years. So we've been borrowing for years. And this is bipartisan. This isn't only one party doing this. We've been borrowing against the pensions at 8.3% for years. And this can started getting kicked down the road a long time. Well, I'm governor now where the can is stopping. And it's going to be a little bit when we put the, you know, grab the can, it's going to cause a whole lot of, you know, consternation, but we got to do it. But, but what's, when we don't pay bills, you know, government accounting is, if the cash, if the dollar didn't leave the drawer, we didn't spend it. Oh my goodness. Yes, we did. We, you know, if you know, with cruel accounting in business, you couldn't run a business without that. We don't do that in, in government. You don't pay a bill, we didn't spend the money. We, <laughs> hello? So, so, so we, we incur liabilities, we don't pay, and you know what, we're paying 12% interest on a lot of the bills we haven't paid. You're paying 12% interest. On a lot of the other bills, we're paying 9% interest. And on the pensions that we're not funding, we're paying 8.3% interest. Hello? And look, what really frosts me, they raised taxes very highly in fiscal year 10, 11. That's still going up. Hello. And they're not honest about this. This is not, they've been hiding. And now when I get in and look under the covers, you know, it's people in the media, when I get, after we won the election, I said, it's worse than I thought. Let me tell you something. I've been looking deep under the covers of these different departments. There's bills in the drawers. And, there's, and you know what the, my predecessor did? He said, I'm going to win this election, you and this department. We're going we're gonna to give you a lower appropriation than last year because otherwise the media would beat me up and I've got to look like I'm being disciplined. You can ignore the appropriation. Just keep doing what you need to do. And by the way, we're going to win the election and then we'll, we'll jack up the taxes after and then we'll fix all, you know, you can even go more. So not only do you not have to cut it all, you can stay at your old level and we'll work it out later. And so I walk in there and like, hello? And we've got departments running out of money in the next couple of weeks. We're, we're halfway through the year and they're running out of money. Come on. It's a, it's a well, I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> so conflicts of interest in state government, they're everywhere. Let's talk about one of the biggest, maybe the biggest. So we finally woke up and we, we stopped taking political campaign cash at the state level from businesses who contract with the state. And Republicans did a lot of shenanigans with this, I'll tell you. Republicans would run for office, they'd get business big, big cash from com companies that contract with the state, and they'd make sure their buddies got the state contracts or whatever. Un it's just unforgivable. But we've stopped a lot of that. We haven't stopped all of it, we stopped a lot of it. But we, don't, we didn't stop the, the government unions. The government unions contract 100% with the state. And they're unlimited. And, and how does it go? Think about this. I mean, so you're a elected official. I'm a government union boss. And I say, OK, you're running for office. Here, I'll give you $3 million from my campaign, you know, our dues, which are taxpayer paid. I'll give you 5,000 of my members to work, and we'll at least say they're not doing it on taxpayer time. And, and then uh, the, after you win, let's negotiate our pension and our work rules and our health care. Come on. That's a conflict of interest. If that went on in business all the time, somebody would get fired at a minimum, but probably somebody would go to jail. And this is what's going on here. Fewer dollars where they need to go, jobs leaving the Illinois, and the little circle up there with the politicians and their buddies making a lot of money for each other. That's a broken system right there. That's a broken loop right there. Here's a little, just one factoid. There's a whole bunch we could list, but let me. So Blagojevich, he put in card check in the government. And I have friends who are AFSCME members who told me at Lincoln Day Dinners, they'd come to me and say, I didn't even want to have to join, I didn't want to join the union. They came in our department and said, sign this card. And I said, no, I don't want to join the union. You sign this card. I said, no. We know where your wife works. We know where your kids go to school. You sign this card. It'll make your life holy heck. Forces unionization. Gives huge raises if you're in the union, huge raises in the contracts, no raises, denying raises for non-union members. If you don't join the union, you get no pay increase. Join the union, we'll get a pay increase. Don't join, you don't get one. Come on. That's just wrong. That is just fundamentally wrong. 
got millions and millions of dollars of campaign cash. We are the most unionized state government in America. And it's all a closed loop with the politicians and the government union bosses. Forcing workers to do this, forcing the taxpayers out of the loop. It's wrong. It's broken. Quinn and Blagojevich, 25 million bucks from this group. It's a fundamental conflict of interest. Just one example. So, uh, teachers, you, you, teachers don't have a choice in Illinois. They have to. You're going to teach, you've got you to pay the union dues. $1,000 forced, whether you agree with the philosophy, the politics, or whatever. It's not right. I believe people spin me as, oh, Bruce, you're anti-union. I'm not anti-union. I'm anti-conflict of interest. I want workers to choose to join a union if you want. Don't join a union if you want. People should be able to decide. I believe in freedom and American choice. I, I think that's the right thing. My grandfather was in a union. I'm not anti-union. But I don't want conflict and I don't want force. I don't want threat. People should be able to decide. So let's just talk quickly about K to, K education. Here's, uh, here's an unsustainable slide. Our, our student population has been declining slowly, not rapidly. It's been flat. To, it's down. K to 12 spending up substantially. This is not sustainable. And what's really uh, tough for our property owners is the state share. We're 50th. We're bottom. We're the worst state for state support to education. We're the lowest state government support of education of any state in America. Terrific. There's another great place to be. The worst. Every, on everything that matters, why are we always 48th or 49th or 50? So, and and this, this forces um, the state share has been sliding down. This forces more and more pressure on local property taxes. Unsustainable. The education bureaucracy in Illinois is stunningly big. I won't bore you with all the lists, but there's just a lot, you know, departments and groups and commissions and bureaucracy. And we have seven, th well, oh, if I didn't do that. So, um, <laughs> so, so we have 7,000 units of government in Illinois, double the typical state, 7,000 units of government. Um, and here's just where some of this, so, we, have, we put 150 uh, man, uh, uh, unfunded mandates on the education system since 92. School districts are legally barred. We restrict by regulations of, at state level what school districts can do and how much they can contract with private or independent or to save money. It's not allowed. And the prevailing wage restrictions and the PLA, the, con the forced, the, the, the project labor, labor agreements, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars every year forced an extra cost put on the burden of the taxpayers, and it, it keeps us, every, if, if we have to spend 20% more to build a building, to build a school, think how many fewer classrooms we can build with the same amount of money. Think, think how many fewer education services we can support with, from the taxpayers given that cost structure. Not competitive, it's not fair. We have forced uncompetitive bidding in Illinois. Not, it's not fair. The governments ought to be able to choose how you, how you do your bidding, who's, who's going to bid and what the rules should be. Why does, it, why does the state force it and force it higher? Because of that loop that I was talking about. That's why. And this is a big issue for me. This is a ballpark number. But basically half of the money's getting into the classroom with the teacher's salary who's working and with the kids, and half is going to stuff, other stuff. And it's a number, you know, depends on the school district and the specific issues. But we have got to get a handle on the stuff outside the administration, the bureaucracy, the layers, and get it in the classroom, force teacher salaries. I'm a big advocate for teachers. I want teachers well paid with good benefits and treated like professionals. And, and the money that goes into the other stuff doesn't get with the teachers. And that's a, that's a, big, that's a, that's a big thing we've got to deal with and change. Here's abuse. There's all, everywhere I look in the pension system, and we're going to do a big pension reform, but everywhere I look in the pension system, there's a lot of abuse. People getting stuffed into a substitute teaching job for a few days, they get a pension. People, people you know, people getting two pensions, three pensions. Um, and uh, the spiking that's been in teachers' contracts 
and in, in the, with the, uh, the workers contracts, it's been very abusive. There's been a lot of, you know, hey, you, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. I'll jack up your salary right at the end. So when you, when you leave, you can get a much bigger, we've got people making more in retirement, way more than when they were working. That ain't right. That was not the intent of the system. And then they changed it. It used to be a lot of spiking. Then they put it down with this language. And what happens is now 6% is basically the contracted floor, how much of the spiking goes on. That's not fixing the problem. And it's a typical Illinois way of fixing something. This is, oh, it was media was on it, so they, and it doesn't really, their cronies, the closed loop is still protecting itself with this. And here, this really frosts me. So now there's two slides on community colleges. Um, Here's a, here, we're failing on our education system. And by the way, the ISAT, it's a, ISAT I said to the R, I, in only standardized test, the ISAT, good riddance, I'm glad it's gone. It's been a travesty for years, and it's been manipulated to dummy down and make it look like our schools were getting better when they weren't. So it's good the ISAT's gone. I am worried about Park and how politicized that whole thing is. I don't know yet. I'm trying to figure that out. But. We are, not, we are not educating our kids to, to succeed in college or career. And um, we are forcing our community colleges to become remedial schools. We're, we're, our community colleges are too often, their, their job is to make up for the failure of K-12 school. That's not what community colleges should be about. Community colleges should be educating people with specific occupational, technical, and vocational training so they can maximize their incomes. And we've got to fix this. We have to fix this. The high schools and the, and the K, to, K to 8 has to do its job. So we don't need this level of remediation that's been going on. And look at this. We, we have, we, this really frosts me. We, we've got declines in, par, in participation in technical training and vocational training. And we, we used to do vocational training well 30, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And you know what, one of the biggest complaints from, as I travel the state for business, I would talk to business owners and they'd say, gosh, we're frustrated with the taxes, the regulations, and you know, Indiana's looking better, Texas looking better. But you know what? Hundreds of businesses said to me, Bruce, we've got jobs here. We have jobs. We'd like to hire more people. We can't find the people who've got the technical skills. And this is, this is, I'm not talking about rocket science. I'm talking about technical skills in welding or computer, basic computer skills to fill the jobs. That's a fundamental failure of our education system. We have, got to, we have got to fix this, and we've got, you know, that's one, I don't like the European economic model for lots of reasons, but you know what, something that Germany does well in a lot of European countries, they are rigorous about education, and you can choose, you want to be on the professional track to go to law school, medical school, liberal arts, or do you want to, you know, rigorous, high-quality vocational and occupational training, and you can choose that as a teenager, and I think we've got to do more of that, you know, we've got to go much more in that direction. So our young people, because not everybody's destined to be a four-year, I mean, hell, let's have, excuse my language, let's have everybody um, go to four-year college, that's terrific if they want to, but there's a lot who don't want to or can't or, what, or whatever. Let's, um, let's get, there's no reason everybody can't have the, the technical skills and occupational skills to have a good career. Not a minimum wage job, a good career. So U of I, quickly. Love U of I. Critical asset, very important. And I want the U of I, I'm very focused on this. I haven't been down yet because I've been drinking from a fire hose since I won the election, but I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be very focused on the U of I. I re, U of I already is a major driver for us. I want to take it to a whole nother several levels up and really have the U of I a massive, powerful engine for economic growth and job creation through the state. This, we can do this. We can do, we can do, U of I can do much more than already. Already good, very good, but we can do more. Here's just some preliminary thoughts, my biases. First of all, I've heard a lot of chatter from my friends that some of the adjustments, whether it's pension stuff or other things, is hurting our competitiveness in recruiting faculty. We can't let that happen. We have got to have the best faculty in the world at the U of I. Must compete, must have the best faculty in the world. Best researchers in the world. <coughs> And I got to know, I need to know from the team what we got to tweak or change or adjust. Have to have the best faculty in the world. We have got to deal with the bureaucracy. 
goodness, everywhere. I mean, I'm, I, haven't, I haven't gone deep with our team yet on the bureaucracy at the U of I, but I've, I've got friends who, you know, we got to deal with it. And I'm going to demand that we deal with it because I'd like to be able to put more resources in here, but I want them going to where they need to go, not into the bureaucracy. So we've got to be competitive. And I have other slides, I'm not doing them today. The cost for the identical job in the government sector, in the education sector, that cost the salary for that job in the, regular, in the real world, in the business world, the disparities are pretty stunning. And it's not fair. It's not fair to taxpayers, it's not fair to the students, it's not fair to the faculty when their money is getting, should be where we, where we need to compete, where the quality gets driven. Um, I think you're taking, starting to take the steps on tuition. We're 40, again, why are we at the bottom? 46th for uh, four-year university affordability. Why are we always at the bottom of stuff? And here, this is a big deal to me. This one, big deal. I really want the U of I, because it's got one of the greatest uh, engineering schools in the world, one of the greatest applied sciences programs in the world. We should make sure it's impacting the state and driving the economy of the state. And I'm a venture capitalist, and I want to see more venture capital here in Champaign, more venture capital, more uh, advanced manufacturing, more driving of impact. And I want to get the resources here to help the U of I expand its footprint here in Champaign dramatically, but also around the state. <coughs> this is a big deal. I'm very focused on this. If the, if the university um, will work with me on these issues, I want to help make this happen on a major scale. Huge economic driver for the next 30, 40 years. It would be very exciting to make that happen. So, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Uh, I look forward to being your ally and your partner. We've got a lot to do. Uh, we're, we're trying to be a very open and two-way communication to the administration. If you've got a problem or an issue, let us know. I can't fix a problem I don't know about. If you see an opportunity we're not taking advantage of, please let us know. If, if um, you're mad that we're going in a direction you think is fundamentally wrong, let us know. I'm working for you. Our team is working for you. We want to be, try to be responsive. I apologize right now. Uh, I joke before drinking from a fire hose. It's really true. I mean, we're, it's a bit, we, there's a lot to say grace over. Um, and I feel like, I feel like, you know, most, by, by about 9 o'clock every night, I feel like the fire hose has been in my face. It's not going sideways, it's kind of going like this. <laughs> and, um, uh, but, but we, we are, we, the time to move is now, the time to act is now, and we need your input. If you're not thriving, we're failing. And I'm going to measure my success by how strong the business community is around the state and how many jobs we're creating and how many high quality careers with high paying careers we're creating. And that's what you do. And I want to be your best ally you've ever had. I want to be the best advocate you've ever had. And I'll test. I'll be here in Champaign County a lot. I'll be testing, seeing how we're doing. There's a, there's a lot. It's, 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 it's uh, hard to move everything on a dime, but we can begin the process. So thank you for your time today. It's been an honor to be with you. I look forward to working together. Thanks very much.